last glacial period, 12,000 years ago. The land is still rising, the retreat of the glaciers, allowing further pots of the landscape to emerge. What used to be the sandy bottom of the sea when my mother was a child is now part of our garden. The rocks under my feet are a reminder of the geological time in which we are but a speck. Being there, the brevity of my life is made salient where my grandmother lives. I can see our family tree on the wall, the fragile lines of farmers and rural workers reaching back into the 16th century. As I climb the mountains that rise out of the ocean, I can see the scale of glacial time still forming the landscape in which we find ourselves. To return to my family house is to be reminded of how my life is dependent on history, both the natural history of evolution the social history of those who came before me. Who I can be and what I can do is not generated solely by me. My life is dependent on previous generations and on those who took care of me, with all of us in turn dependent on a history of the earth that so easily could have been different and that might never have brought any of us into being. Moreover, my life is historical in the sense that it is orientated towards a future that is not of which I am part, the projects I sustain and that sustain me, can flourish and change in a dynamic way, but they can also break apart, atrophy and die. The worlds that open up through my family and friends, the projects that shape my work and political commitments, carry the promise of my life, but also the risk that my life will be shattered or fail to make sense. In a word, both my life and the projects in which I am engaged are finite. forever. I could never take my life to be at stake and would never be seized by the need to do 
sense of a finite lifetime that gives urgency to any project or activity. The sense of my own irreplaceable life, then, is inseparable from my sense that it will end. When I return to the same landscape every summer, part of what makes it so poignant is that I may never see it again. Moreover, I care for the preservation of the landscape because I am aware that even the duration of the natural environment is not guaranteed. Likewise, my devotion to the ones I love is inseparable from the sense that they cannot be taken for granted. My time with family and friends is precious because we have to make the most of it. Our time together is illuminated by the sense that it will not last forever, and we need to take care of one another because our lives are fragile. The sense of finitude, the sense of the ultimate fragility of everything we care about, is at the heart of what I call secular faith. To have secular faith is to be devoted to a life that will end, to be dedicated to projects that can fail or break down, ranging from the concrete, how we approach funerals, to the general, what makes a life worth living. I will show how secular faith expresses itself in the ways we mourn our loved ones, make commitments and care about a sustainable world. I call it secular faith because it is devoted to a form of life that is bounded by time. In accordance with the meaning of the Latin word secularis, to have secular faith is to be dedicated to persons or projects that are worldly and temporal. Secular faith is the form of faith that we all sustain in caring for someone or something that is vulnerable to loss. We all care for ourselves, for others, for the world in which we find ourselves, and care is inseparable from the risk of loss. In contrast, the common denominator for what I call religious forms of faith is a devaluation of our finite lives as a lower form of being. All world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam and Christianity, after the highest form of existence or the most desirable form of life is eternal rather than finite. Or to adopt a religious perspective on life is to regard our finitude as a lack, an illusion, or a fallen state of being. Moreover, such a religious perspective on life is not limited to institutionalized religion or to actual believers. Even many people who do not have religious faith still subscribe to the idea that our finitude is a restriction and that we suffer from a lack of eternal life. From a religious perspective, our finitude is seen as a lamentable that ideally should be overcome. This is the premise with, with which I take issue. I seek to show that any life worth living must be finite and requires secular faith. Secular faith is committed to persons and projects that may be lost, to make them live on for the future. Far from being resigned to death, a secular faith seeks to postpone death and improve the conditions of life. As we will see, living on should not be conflated with eternity. The commitment to living on does not express an aspiration to live forever, but to live longer and to live better, not to overcome death, but to extend the duration and improve the quality of a form of life. The commitment to living on bears the sense of finitude within itself. However long the movement of living may last, and however much the quality of living on may be improved, it can always end. Even when we fight for an ideal that extends far beyond our own lives, a political vision of the future, a sustainable legacy for generations to come, we are devoted to a form of life that may cease to be or never come to be. This sense of finitude is intrinsic to why it matters that anyone or anything lives on. If we seek to engender, prolong or enhance the existence of something, to make it live on in a better way, we are animated by the sense that it may be lost if we fail to act. Without this risk of loss, our efforts and our fidelity to the project would not be required. To have secular faith is to acknowledge that the object of our faith is dependent on the practice of faith. I call it secular faith, since the object of devotion does not exist independently of those who believe in its importance and who keep it alive through their fidelity. The object of secular faith, e.g. the life we are trying to lead, the institutions we are trying to build, trying to achieve is inseparable from what we do and how we do it. Through the practice of secular faith, we bind ourselves to a normative ideal, a conception of who we ought to be as individuals and as a community. The ideal itself, however, depends on how we keep faith with our commitment and remains open to being challenged, transformed or overturned. The object of religious faith, by contrast, is taken to faith, whether God or any other form of infinite being, is ultimately regarded as separable from the practice of faith, since it does not depend on any form of finite life. The most fundamental example of finitude in our historical moment 
the standpoint of religious faith, such an end of life is only apparent. Even if all forms of living on are terminated, nothing essential is lost, since the essential is eternal rather than finite. As William James observes in the conclusion to his classic work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, the subordination of the finite to the eternal is the common denominator both for orthodox religions and for all forms of religious mysticism. This world may indeed, as science assures us, some day burn up or freeze, James writes, but for those with religious faith, God's existence is the guarantee of an ideal order that should be permanently preserved. Accordingly, from a religious point of view, the end of the world is ultimately not a tragedy. On the contrary, many religious doctrines and religious visions look forward to the end of the world as the moment of salvation. This moment can either be imagined as the collective end of humankind when damnation and salvation are decided, as in Judaism, Christianity and Islam, or as the end of an individual through absorption into a timeless state of being, as in Hinduism and Buddhism. In either case, our lives as finite beings are not seen as ends in themselves, but rather as a means to reach the end of human history. For the same reason, climate change and the possible destruction of the earth cannot be seen as an existential threat from the standpoint of religious faith. To grasp the existential threat to yourself and to future generations, you have to believe not only that life is finite, but also that everything valuable Everything that matters depends on finite life. This is exactly what religious faith denies. If you have religious faith, you believe that all finite life can be terminated, and yet what is truly valuable will still remain. The Dalai Lama summed it up perfectly when asked how a Buddhist, for whom the finite world is an illusion and who seeks to be detached from everything that passes away, can be worried about our current ecological crisis. A Buddhist would say it didn't matter. Dalai Lama replied. This may seem surprising, since Buddhist ethics famously advocates a peaceful relation to nature and all living beings. Yet Buddhist ethics is not motivated by a concern for nature or living beings as ends in themselves. Rather, the motivation is to be released from karma, from the aim of being released from life altogether and helping others to reach the same goal. The goal of Buddhism is not for anyone to live on, or for the earth itself to live on, but to attain the state of nirvana, when nothing matters. The Buddhist perspective is not an exception, but makes explicit what is implicit in any religious commitment to eternity. If you are aiming for eternal life, finite life does not matter for its own sake, but serves as a vehicle to attain salvation. Of course, even if you identify as religious, you can still care intensely for the fate of our life on earth. My point, however, is that if you care for our form of life as an end in itself, you are acting on the basis of secular faith, even if you claim to be religious. Religious faith can entail obedience to moral norms, but it cannot recognize that the ultimate purpose of what we do, the ultimate reason it matters how we treat one another and the earth, is our fragile life together. From a religious perspective, the ultimate purpose of what we do is to serve God or to attain salvation, rather than to care for our shared lives and the future generations for which we are responsible. As soon as we acknowledge that our finite lives and the generations that may carry on our finite legacy are ends in themselves, we make explicit that our faith is secular rather than religious. Hence our ecological crisis can be taken seriously only from the standpoint of secular faith. Only a secular faith can be committed to the flourishing of finite life, sustainable forms of life on earth, as an end in itself. If the earth itself is an object of care in our time of ecological crisis, it is because we have come to believe that it is a resource that can be exhausted, an ecosystem that can be damaged or destroyed. Whether we care about the earth for its own sake or for the sake of the species that depend on it, the awareness of its precarious existence is an intrinsic part of why we care about it. This is not to say that we care about the earth only because it can be lost. If we care about the earth, it is rather because of the positive qualities we ascribe to it. However, an intrinsic part of why we care about the positive qualities of the earth is that we believe they can be lost, either for us or in themselves. The same holds for the ways in which we care about our own lives, or those by whom we are responsible. Caring about someone or something requires that we believe in its value, but also requires that we believe that what is valued can cease to be. In order to care, we have to believe in the future not only as a chance, but also as a risk. Only in the light of risk, only in the light of possible failure or loss, can we be committed to sustaining the life of what we value. Secular faith is not in itself sufficient to lead a responsible life, and it does not automatically make one improve the conditions of the world, but it is necessary.
necessary for motivating ethical, political and filial commitments. Accordingly, I will seek to show that secular faith lies at the heart of the sense of responsibility. Let me take a basic example, the golden rule. To treat others as you would like to be treated is a fundamental principle in both secular and religious moral teachings. The golden rule, however, does not require any form of religious faith. On the contrary, a genuine care for others must be based on secular faith. If you follow the golden rule because you believe it is a divine command, you are motivated by obedience to God rather than by care for another person. Likewise, if you follow the golden rule because you believe it will yield a divine reward, e.g. the release from karma, you are acting not out of concern for the well-being of others, but rather out of concern for your own salvation. If your care for another person is based on religious faith, you will cease to care about her if you lose your religious faith, and thereby reveal that you never cared about her as an end in herself. As with all the arguments in this book, I address here both religious and secular audiences. I invite the readers who identify as religious to ask themselves if their care for others is actually motivated by faith in a divine command or divine reward. Moreover, I encourage both religious and secular readers to recognise their commitment to finite life as the condition of responsibility. The golden rule does not depend on a religious sense of eternity. On the contrary, it depends on a secular sense of finitude. To treat others as we ourselves would like to be treated requires that we recognise our shared finitude, since only finite beings can be in need of mutual care. The infinite being is never in need of anything and cannot care about how it is treated. The golden rule, therefore, demands that we recognise one another as finite and keep faith with one another as ends in ourselves. It is because I am finite that I am in need and that it can matter to me how I am treated. Likewise, it is because I recognise you as finite that I can understand that you are in need and that it matters how I treat you. If we do not recognise our shared vulnerability and finitude, the demand for mutuality is not intelligible and we cannot be compelled to care for one another as ends in ourselves. Hence, I will present a vision of the emancipatory potential of recognising our secular faith and our essential finitude. The emancipatory potential of secular faith is a possibility and far from being achieved in our current state of secularisation which should not be conflated with an emancipated form of secular life. Moreover, even in being achieved, a secular life will always remain fragile, since it is sustained only through our commitments. The recognition of finitude does not provide any guarantee that we will care for one another in the right way. The recognition of our shared finitude is a necessary condition for the demand of mutual care to be intelligible, but this recognition is in no way sufficient for actual mutuality. Rather, our dependence on one another and the fragility of our lives call for us to develop institutions of social justice and material welfare. Our ability to treat others justly depends on how we have been treated and cared for in turn, all the way from our first experiences of parental love to the organisation of the society in which we find ourselves. Only a circular perspective allows us to focus on these normative practices, our forms of upbringing, education, labour, political governance and so on as essentially matters of what we do, as practices for which we are responsible and that have to be sustained or questioned or revised by us, rather than being by being given by nature or supernatural decree. For the same reason, secular faith is the condition for freedom. To be free, I argue, is not to be sovereign or liberated from all constraints. Rather, we are free because we are able to ask ourselves what we ought to do with our time. All forms of freedom e.g. the freedom to act, the freedom to speak, the freedom to love, are intelligible as freedom, only insofar as we are free to engage the question of what we should do with our time. If we're given what we should do, what we should say, and whom we should love, in short, if it were given what we should do with our time, we would not be free. The ability to ask this question, the question of what we ought to do with our time, is the basic condition for what I call spiritual freedom lead a free spiritual life rather than a life determined merely by natural instincts, I must be responsible for what I do. This is not to say that I am free from natural and social constraints. I did not choose to be born with the limitations and abilities I happen to have. Moreover, I had no control over who took care of me, what they did to me and for me. My family and the larger historical context into which I was born shaped me before I could do anything about it to inform who I can take myself to be and what I can do with my life. Without social norms, norms I did not invent on my own and 
that shape the world in which I find myself. I can have no understanding of who to be and w or what to do. Nevertheless, I am responsible for upholding, challenging, or transforming these norms. I am not merely casually, causally determined by nature or norms, but act in light of norms that I can challenge and transform. This is what it means to have a spiritual life. Even at the price of my biological survival, my material well-being, or my social standing, I can give my life for a principle to which I hold myself, or for a cause in which I believe. My freedom therefore requires that I can ask myself what I should do with my time. Even when I am utterly absorbed in what I do, what I say, and what I love, the possibility of this question must be alive in me. Being engaged in my activities, I must run the risk of being bored, otherwise my engagement would be a matter of compulsive necessity. To what I love, I must run the risk of losing it or giving it up, otherwise there would be nothing at stake in maintaining and actively relating to what I love. Most fundamentally, I must live in relation to my irrevocable death, otherwise I would believe that my time is infinite and there would be no urgency in dedicating my life to anything. The condition of our freedom, then, is that we understand ourselves as finite, only in light of the apprehension that we will die and that our lifetime is indefinite but finite. We can ask ourselves what we ought to do with our lives and put ourselves at stake in our activities. This is why all religious visions of eternity, as we shall see, ultimately are visions of unfreedom. In the consummation of eternity, there would be no question of what we should do with our lives. We would be absorbed in bliss forever and thereby deprived of any possible agency. Rather than having a free relation to what we do and what we love, we would be compelled by necessity to enjoy it. This live addresses both the religious and secular audiences. I invite the religious and religiously inclined to ask themselves if they actually have faith in eternity and if this faith is compatible with the care that animates their lives. Furthermore, I encourage both religious and secular readers to see why the finitude of our lives should not be regarded as a lack, a restriction or a fallen condition. Instead of lamenting the absence of eternity, we should acknowledge the commitment to finite life is the condition for anything to be at stake anyone to lead a free life. My critique of religious faith does not primarily appeal to scientific knowledge, and my critique of religious values does not primarily appeal to scientific facts. Rather, I provide a new perspective on what we believe and what we value. In caring about anyone or anything, we are already practicing an implicit form of secular faith in what we do, since we are devoted to someone or something that is fragile. My aim is to make our secular faith explicit in our understanding of what we do and thereby open up emancipatory possibilities for transforming our practices of care as well as our communal life. My argument challenges one of the most widely held assumptions about religion. According to many surveys, more than 50% of Americans hold that religious faith is necessary to live a moral, responsible life. The same assumption is part of a more general revival of political theology among both prominent philosophers and the general public. The intellectual historian Peter E. Gordon provided the most capacious definition of political theology, while tracing its resurgence in thinkers such as Charles Taylor, Jürgen Habermas, and Jose Casanova. In Gordon's account, political theology is defined by two theses. The first thesis, thesis postulates a normative deficit. A secular life suffers from a lack of moral substance and cannot establish a viable ground for a political life together. The second thesis postulates a religious plenitude. To compensate for its normative deficit, secular life must turn to religion as the unique and privileged resource of moral political instruction without which society cannot cohere. As Gordon shows, these two theses of political theology are remarkably persistent not only in the history of ideas, but also in contemporary philosophy and sociology. Such political theology contributes to a pervasive negative narrative regarding the possibilities of secular life. In our secular age, faith in eternal life or eternal being is said to have declined. Yet there is a widespread notion that the lapse in religious faith is a great loss and that the hope for eternity expresses our deepest desire, even if it cannot be fulfilled. Secular life would then be characterized by both a normative and an existential deficit. Owing to secularization, we have supposedly lost both the moral foundation that is required to hold our society together and the redemptive hope that is needed to find meaning in our lives. The most influential version of such a negative assessment of secular life was formulated by the sociologist Max Weber in the early 20th century. Weber
his fame was claimed that secular life suffers from a disenchantment of the world continues to serve as an alibi for political theology and to instill the sense that a society without religious faith is hopelessly lacking. According to Weber, disenchantment has three major implications. First, disenchantment means that we no longer appeal to any mysterious incalculable forces or any other forms of supernatural explanation for what happens in the world. Rather, the form of reason becomes an instrumental reason which assumes that we can, in principle, control everything by means of calculation. Second, Weber takes a disenchantment to mean that the ultimate and most sublime values have retreated from public life, so that we are deprived of any form of genuine community. Third, Weber laments that disenchantment entails that death is no longer a meaningful phenomenon. Weber holds that the human beings who lived in an enchanted world, his example is Abraham or some peasant of the past, had a meaningful relation to death because they supposedly died fulfilled by life and regarded themselves as belonging to an organic cycle. When Abraham or the peasant of the past was on the verge of death, he could take himself to have had enough of life because it had been given to him what life had to offer, and for him there remained no puzzles he might wish to solve. In contrast, the person whom Weber describes as disenchanted, quote, civilized man, can ever regard his life as completed, since he is committed to the possibility of progress, the continuous enrichment of culture by ideas, knowledge and problems in which he wants to participate. Such a person will always be dissatisfied, Weber argues, since his life can never be completed. Quote, what he sees is always something provisional and not definitive, and therefore death for him is a meaningless occurrence. End quote. Rather than being seen as a meaningful conclusion of a life, as the ascent to eternity, death becomes to be regarded as the meaningless interruption of a life. This leads Weber to the conclusion that the commitment to earthly progress makes our lives meaningless rather than meaningful. Because death is meaningless, civilized life as such is meaningless. By its very progressiveness, it gives death the imprint of meaninglessness. Ever since Weber delivered his diagnosis in the early 20th century, many thinkers have tried to offer a cure for disenchantment and sense of meaninglessness that are supposedly inherent in secular life. My argument is, on the contrary, that the diagnosis itself is deeply misleading and should be called into question on every count. The basic problem is that Weber fails to grasp the commitment to freedom that is a distinct historical achievement of modern secular life. For Weber, all that remains when we subtract religious norms and values from our lives is an impoverished instrumental reason that disables any ultimate value or genuine community. Yet the idea of an instrumental reason that operates on its own is unintelligible. We cannot reason instrumentally without a purpose for the sake of which we leave our lives, since nothing can count as a means except in light of a value that we hold to be an end in itself. If we had no defining purposes, if everything were reduced to instrumental means, it would be impossible to understand the point of doing anything. In contrast to religious faith, secular faith recognizes that the defining purposes of our lives depend on our commitments. The authority of our norms cannot be established by divine revelation or natural properties that must be instituted, upheld, and justified by our practices. If we do not appeal to mysterious forces or a supernatural authority, it does not mean, as Faber claims, that we believe everything can be mastered by calculation. On the contrary, to have secular faith is to acknowledge that we are essentially dependent on and answerable to other persons who cannot be mastered or controlled, since we are all free, finite beings. By the same token, the norms in light of which we lead our lives can be called into question, contested and revised. Far from being an impediment to genuine community, the recognition that we are responsible for the form of our shared life is at the heart of the modern secular commitment to democracy. Like other political theologians, however, Weber has no faith in democracy as an actual power of the people, but believes that democracy must be subordinated to a charismatic leader, a Führer, as Weber designated the function 15 years before Hitler's ascent to power. Without a leader who occupies the role of a religious authority, democracy supposedly will have no animating soul, since for Weber there is no feature of secular life itself that can bind people together in genuine community. Hence, while Weber portrays himself as someone who offers a value-neutral diagnosis, his negative assessment of the possibilities of secular life betrays his religious presuppositions. By religious presuppositions, I do not mean that Weber believes in God or eternity, but that he regards our finitude as a negative restriction and assumes that secular life necessarily suffers from a lack of meaning. Weber pro 
prides himself on having the courage to face the emptiness of life with their religion, contrasting himself to those who cannot bear the fate of the times and flee into the arms of the old churches. But his idea of secular life as empty or meaningless is itself a religious notion. Thus, when Weber claims that the commitment to earthly progress makes our lives meaningless rather than meaningful, the authority to which he appeals is the devoutly religious the author Leo Tolstoy. Weber's entire argument here exhibits a striking inability to understand the dynamic of leading a free, finite life. Weber apparently thinks that a fulfilling life should lead one to a sense of final satisfaction or completion, where one has had enough of life and can welcome death itself as meaningful. This is a profoundly misguided view of what it means to be a person who is leading her life. Being a person is not a goal that can be achieved, but a purpose that must be sustained. For example, if I take my vocation to be sociology, as Weber did, I understand the significance of my life in light of my commitment to being a sociologist. Being a sociologist is not a project that can be completed, but a purpose for the sake of which I lead my life and engage in what I do. If my life as a sociologist is satisfying, it does not mean that I have had enough of being a sociologist. On the contrary, it means that I am committed to sustaining my life as a sociologist. Even if I retire as a sociologist and focus on other activities, I am still committed to being a sociologist insofar as I identify with the work I have done, an identification that can include revising my views or conceding that the work of others has superseded my own. If I were truly done with being a sociologist, if I had truly had had enough, it would mean that I had renounced any form of care for the work I did and who I was as a sociologist. Even if I am done with being a sociologist, however, my life is not complete. As long as I lead my life, I have to be committed to one or several purposes, e.g. being retired, being a grandparent, being a citizen, being a friend, which define who I take myself to be. Leading my life is not a process that can end in final fulfilment, but an activity that I have to sustain for the sake of something that matters to me. Even if a defining purpose of my life breaks down, the breakdown matters to me because I am striving to have a purpose. The activity of leading my life, my striving to have a purpose, cannot even in principle be completed. If my life were complete, it would not be my life, since it would be over. In leading my life, I am not striving for an impossible completion of who I am, but for the possible and fragile coherence of who I am trying to be, to hold together and be responsive to the commitments that define who I take myself to be. Leading a satisfying life is not to achieve a state of consummation, but to be engaged in what I do and put myself at stake in activities that matter to me. For the same reason, if I reach a point when I welcome death because I've had enough of myself altogether, it does not mean that my life is fulfilled and reveals its final meaning. On the contrary, if I've had enough of my life, it means that I'm failing to leave and lead a meaningful life. Death cannot be a meaningful completion of my life, since my life is not something that can be not something I can experience as the completion of anything, since it excludes my existence. As long as my life is mine, as long as I lead my life, the book of my life is still open, and it is neither possible nor desirable to be done with myself. Contrary to what Weber holds, there is no correlation between leading a meaningful life and embracing death as the supposed completion of life. As long as our lives matter to us, we are committed to the continuation rather than the completion of our lives. For the same reason, the commitment to the possibility of progress, which entails what we care about, extends beyond and cannot be completed in our own lifetime, does not make our lives meaningless. On the contrary, part of the meaning of what we do is that it can have significance for future generations and make their lives better than ours. If we take the possibility of democratic process seriously, we should therefore counter Weber's conservative nostalgia for a pre-modern enchanted world. As the critic Bruce Robbins has argued in an insightful analysis of Weber, the suggestion that genuine community is to exist amidst any consideration of those who were excluded from such community, the slaves and women of ancient Greece, to pick at random from a long series of examples. Opinion on the genuineness of community would depend on who his experience was consulted. If you asked landless labourers in the Middle Ages, such community might have seemed less unquestionably genuine. Furthermore, if contemporary workers express greater discontent with their lives than did Weber's imagined peasant of the past, it is a result of rising expectations rather than disenchantment, a product of democratic progress to be set against centuries of resignation by the poor 
all of their inevitable social fate. No, there was no malaise back then. Why? Because people knew their places. Quote. We can thus offer a quite different diagnosis of our predicament than the one proposed by Weber and his followers. The dissatisfactions of our current state of secularization are not due to the idea of progress. As Robbins emphasizes, the dissatisfactions are rather due to the failure of progress, namely our failure to achieve a level of social justice that the pre-modern world did not even strive to achieve. The key to such an understanding of the promise of secular life can be found in the work of Karl Marx. Marx's thinking is often conflated with the totalitarian communist regimes of the 20th century, but I'll argue that he is the most important inheritor of the secular commitment to freedom and democracy. In contrast to Weber and other political theologians, Marx has no nostalgia for the pre-modern world. Rather, he makes clear that both capitalism and liberalism are historical conditions of possibility for the emancipation that he espouses. This is why Marx, in his critique of capitalism and liberalism, takes issue with these forms of life on their own terms. He seeks to show that capitalism and liberalism require their own overcoming by virtue of the secular commitment they bear within themselves to freedom and democracy. At the time when Marx lived, and subsequently inspired by his writings, there was a growing secular recognition that we are what we do, and that we can do things differently. We do not have to be subjected to the laws of religion or capital, but can transform our historical situation through collective action, and create institutions for the free development of social individuals as an end in itself. Thus in the late 19th and early 20th century, during the same decades when Weber lamented the supposed loss of genuine community, workers formed democratic socialist organisations that provided a sense of practical identity and solidarity, as well as ethical and political purpose. The workers' movements organised youth groups, choirs, book clubs, sports teams and other communal activities. They pursued democracy on the ground by publishing daily newspapers and journals that provided a forum for ongoing open about the stakes and goals of the movement. Workers of all stripes were offered further education, women came together to pursue their own emancipation, and there was a common cause in the shared effort to build a better society. The words of a German miner, aged 33 and with eight children, echo the testimony of many workers of this period. The modern labour movement, he said in 1912, enriches me and all my friends through the growing light of recognition. We understand that we are no longer the anvil, but rather the hammer that forms the future of our own children, and that feeling is worth more than gold. This sense of spiritual freedom, that we can be the subject of our history, and not merely subject to our history, is at the core of Marx's notion of emancipation. The growing international solidarity of the workers' movements was largely broken by the First World War, which erupted in 1914. By the time of the Russian Revolution, in 70, the material and social conditions for creating a new form of society were largely in ruins. As the great political thinker, feminist and activist Rosa Luxemburg observed at the time, Russia was an isolated land, exhausted by world war, strangled by imperialism, betrayed by the international proletariat. Under such circumstances, it was virtually impossible to achieve an exemplary de democratic socialism. As Luxemburg put it, the revolutionaries could not be expected to perform miracles that must be understood within the limits of historical possibilities. Yet already, during the first stages of the Russian Revolution, Luxembourg rightly warned against the dangers of making a virtue of necessity and losing hold of the commitment to democracy. It would be fatal, she maintained, if the revolutionaries were, quote, to freeze into a complete theoretical system all of the tactics forced upon them by these fatal circumstances and place into its storehouse as new discoveries all the distortions prescribed in Russia by necessity and compulsion, in the last analysis only byproducts of the bankruptcy of international socialism, socialism in the present world war. End quote. By the time of Stalin and Mao, the bankruptcy would be in full force. No one who takes up Marx's ideas today should, be, should make any excuses for such totalitarian regimes, which fail to grasp the insights of Marx not only in practice but also in theory to achieve and develop Marx's insights in a new direction, we need instead to engage the fundamental question of freedom with which he is concerned. The task is all the more important because the appeal to freedom in recent decades has been appropriated for agendas on the political right, where the idea of freedom serves to defend the free market and is largely reduced to a formal conception of individual liberty. In response, many thinkers on the political left have re retreated from or even explicitly rejected the idea of freedom. This is a fatal mistake. Any emancipatory politics, as well as any critique of capitalism, requires a conception of freedom. Only in light of a commitment to freedom can we render anything intelligible as oppression, exploitation, or alienation. Moreover, only in light of a commitment to 
you're trying to achieve and why it matters. Thus we cannot understand Marx's critique of capitalism unless we understand the notion of freedom to which he is committed. Understanding this notion requires understanding why questions of economy and material conditions are inseparable from all spiritual questions of freedom. The economic organisation of our society is not a mere instrumental means for the pursuit of individual ends. Rather, our shared economy is itself expressive of how we understand the relation between means and ends. Economic matters are not abstract but concern the most general and concrete questions of what we do with our time. As I will show in detail, how we organise our economy is intrinsic to how we live together and what we collectively value. From his early to his late works, Marx's analysis economic questions proceeded from a philosophical grasp of what it means to be living and free. All living beings are finite, both in the sense that they are not self-sufficient and in the sense that they can die. Living beings must therefore draw on their environment to sustain themselves. A living being cannot simply exist but must do something to stay alive. The need of the living organism to sustain itself, the labour required to keep ourselves alive, minimally defines what Marx calls the realm of necessity. Because we are living beings, we must work to maintain ourselves. Yet all the time we have is not necessarily required to ensure our biological survival, and it is, it is an open question for us what we should do with the surplus of time. This is why for Marx we also live in the realm of freedom. We are able to engage our life activity as a free activity, since we can ask ourselves what to do, and if it is the right thing to do. Moreover, through technological innovations from simple to advance machines, we can reduce the time we need to expand on securing our survival by replacing large parts of our living labour with non-living capacities for producing social goods. We can thereby decrease our realm of necessity, the time required to keep ourselves alive, and increase our realm of freedom, the time available for activities that we count as ends in themselves, which includes time for engaging the question of what matters to us, and which activities we should count as ends in themselves. The exercise of our spiritual freedom depends both on material conditions of production and social relations of recognition. Insofar as we spend our time working a job that is not fulfilling but merely serves as a means for our survival, our labour time is unfree, since we cannot affirm that what we do is an expression of who we are. Instead of being free to engage the question of what makes our life worth living, the question of what we ought to do with our time, our lives are mortgaged to a form of labour that is required for our survival. To live a free life, it is not enough that we have the right to freedom. We must have access to the material resources as well as the forms of education that allow us to pursue our freedom and to own the question of what we do with our time. What belongs to each one of us, what is irreducibly our own, is not property or goods but the time of our lives. To be clear, the emphasis on my own life, on your own life, is not in opposition to sociality. As Marx underlines, my own existence is social activity, and therefore that which I make of myself, I make of myself for society and with the awareness of myself as a social being. Hence to own your life is not to be independent, but be, to be able to acknowledge your dependence. Hence to own your life is not to be independent, but to be able to acknowledge your dependence. A good example is the experience of love. When you love someone, as a friend, as a parent, as a life partner, your dependence on the other is not a restriction that prevents you from being free. Rather, your dependence on the other brings belongs to the life you affirm as your own. Acting on behalf of the one you love is not an alien purpose, but the expression of a commitment in which you can recognize yourself, since caring for the interests and the well-being of the other is part of your own understanding of who you are. Likewise, if the work you do is for the sake of something you believe in as an end in itself, as it is for me when I teach my classes or when I write this book, then even the difficult or exhausting demands of the work are not an external imposition on a prior freedom. On the contrary, the demands of my students and the difficulties of my writing are an intrinsic part of the form of life to which I am committed. That even when it is hard to sustain my work, I can recognise the challenges as ones to which I hold myself. If you cannot see yourself in the purpose of your occupation, then your labour time is alienated, even if your job entails a high salary and a great stroke of social prestige. This may seem like a small problem compared with the labour conditions of most of the people who produce the commodities that populate our world. There is certainly a harrowing difference between those who
to assemble our computers in factories or manufacture our clothes in sweatshops, and those of us who turn on our computers or put on our clothes while forgetting the labour conditions under which they are produced. Yet from Marx's perspective, these issues are all connected, since they concern how our shared economic life is organised and how it is inimical to our freedom. To be able to lead free lives and own what we do, we must be able to see ourselves both in the purpose of our occupation and in the social conditions of the labour that sustains our lives. To recognise our own commitment to freedom in the institutions on which we depend and to which we contribute. Such identification requires that all of us have the freedom to participate in possible transformations of the purpose of what we do. Democratic transformations of the social institutions of labour, as well as the freedom to give up or call into question our supposed vocation in favour of different occupations. In short, our freedom requires that we can own the question of what we do with our time. For Marx, political progress is measured by the degree to which it allows for such freedom. This is why all readings of Marx that posit a final resolution as the goal of politics, either in the form of a totalitarian state or a utopian life that would overcome, overcome finitude, betray the most important insights of his work. The goal is not to overcome finitude, but to transform qualitatively our ability to lead free lives. Even in their most ideal state, our lives will have to rec reckon with the risks of finitude, the risks of losing what we love and losing our ability to do what we love, since these risks are intrinsic to freedom itself. Moreover, there is no question of leaving the realm of necessity behind. How we lead our lives in the realm of freedom is inseparable from how we live our lives in the realm of necessity. As living beings, we will always have to do some form of work to maintain our lives, and labour is not in itself something bad. On the contrary, all forms of free activities, as in my examples of teaching and writing, are themselves forms of labour. An emancipated life is not a life that is free from work, but a life in which we pursue work on the basis of our own commitments. Even our socially necessary labour can be an expression of our freedom if it is shared for the sake of the common good. The aim, then, is to decrease the realm of necessity and increase the realm of freedom by making the relation between the two a democratic question. We will always have to work, for better or, wor or for worse, but what will count as necessary labour and what will count as free labour as a matter of our commitments and our social organisation. For the same reason, the relation between necessity and freedom cannot be settled once and for all, but must always be negotiated. There are no definitive political solutions in Marx, but rather the clarification of a vital problem. What we need to negotiate, both individually and collectively, is how to cultivate the finite time that is the condition of our freedom. We can thus understand why the advent of capitalism is a form of progress for Marx. Wage labour under capitalism is historically the first social form which in principle recognises that each one of us owns the time of our lives, and that our lifetime is inherently valuable. Unlike slaves, who are systematically denied ownership of their time, we are free to sell our labour to someone who is willing to buy it. Moreover, wage labour is explicitly conceived as a means for us to achieve the end of leading a free life. The promise of achieving freedom through wage labour is nece necessarily contradicted, however, by how we measure the value of our lives under capitalism. Marx's critique of the measure of value under capitalism is the most important argument in all of his work, but also the most misunderstood. Contrary to a widely held assumption, among both his followers on the left and his critics on the right, Marx does not su subscribe to a general labour theory of value, which holds that labour is the necessary source for wealth. Rather, Marx argues that the production of wealth under capitalism entails a historically specific measure of value, socially necessary labour time which contradicts the value of free time and must be overcome for the sake of our emancipation. In developing Marx's critique of the capitalist measure of value, I argue that it calls for a revaluation of value. The revaluation in question requires not only a theoretical but also a practical transformation of the way we lead our lives. All the way from our social organisation of labour and our technological production of goods to our forms of education, we need to pursue a revaluation that acknowledges our finite lifetime as the condition for anything to matter and for anything to be valuable. Marx himself has notoriously little to say about how we would be able to lead our lives beyond capitalism. Drawing on what Marx calls communism, however, I outline a new vision of democratic socialism that is committed to providing the material and spiritual conditions for each one of us to lead a free life in mutual recognition of our dependence on one another. Through a critique of capitalism and liberalism on their own terms, I specify the 
their general principles of democratic socialism and elaborate their concrete implications. What I call democratic socialism is neither an imposed blueprint nor an abstract utopia. Rather, I derive the principles of democratic socialism from the commitment to freedom and equality that we already avow. The political project of democratic socialism requires secular faith. To have faith in the possibility of actualizing freedom is not to believe that it is guaranteed or that it can be secured. To have faith in the possibility of freedom is to have faith in something that will always be precarious and contestable, even in its fullest actualization. The struggle for freedom is an act of secular faith because it is committed to a form of individual and collective life that is essentially finite. The commitment to a free, finite life is implicit in all forms of resistance to exploitation and alienation. The only ability that can be exploited or alienated, and the only one that can be liberated, is our ability to own the question of what we do with our time, since that ability is presupposed by all forms of freedom. The ability is certainly developmental and in need of cultural formation, but without faith in such an ability the idea of freedom is unintelligible. To be responsive to the exploitation or alienation of someone's life, you have to believe in the fragile possibility and the intrinsic value of her ability to own her time. The same secular faith is exhibited by anyone who takes up a struggle against her own oppression. To understand yourself as being exploited or alienated, you have to believe that you have a finite and precious time to live and that your own life is being taken away from you when that time is taken away from you. Accordingly, the cultivation of secular faith is indispensable for progressive politics. The pursuit of emancipation requires that we are committed to improving the material and social conditions of freedom as an end in itself. This is why Marx emphasizes that the critique of religion must be accompanied by a critique of the existing forms of our life together. That those who are enslaved or live in poverty may need faith in God to carry on with their lives is not a reason to promote religious faith, but a reason to abolish slavery and poverty. The need for such a critical and emancipatory perspective is as pressing as ever. We live in a living in where social inequality, climate change, and global injustice are intertwined with the resurgence of religious forms of authority that deny the ultimate importance of these matters. The dominant response is to retreat from a secular faith in the possibility of progress, in favour of asserting the necessity of a religious sense of fullness to sustain our moral and spiritual lives. This book seeks to combat all forms of political theology. In contrast, I offer a secular vision of why everything depends on what we do with our time together. Of religious faith in eternity is not something to be lamented. Rather, it provides an opportunity to make, make explicit and strengthen our secular faith in this life as an end in itself.